But with AWS's, you have these two different brands, Trainium and Inferentia, for related, like they're they're related in some in some way as well. So, uh, could you break down for us, uh, you know, the similarities and differences between the Trainium and Inferentia chip? Which, if it isn't obvious from the name, and actually, it took me a while to figure this out myself. So, like when Shruti first came to me, I was comparing side by side. I had on my screen the the web page for Trainium and the web page for Inferentia. And I was reading through all the detail, all the specs, and I was like, "What are the, what's different about these two chips?" And then when I kind of like, it's one of those things where like when you step away from the problem, then it hit me. I was like, "Oh, it's in the name. <laughs> <laughs> Trainium is for training, inference is for inference. Come on." Um, but yeah, so what what are the differences between these two chips? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so first of all, I, I think you're right to point out that, uh, that the chips are very similar, and we, we actually do it on purpose. We, we build one chip architecture, and then we tailor it for training, uh, training workloads with the Trainium form factor, and for inference workloads with the Inferentia form factor. So right when we started uh, quite a few years ago, we kind of had the re- realization that every successful uh, machine learning workload will have to have at scale inference deployment. Otherwise, you train, but you don't use the train model. So, so it doesn't make any sense. So, so we kind of looked through the, the inference problem and thought through what are the key characteristics of, the, of that, that problem. And there are a few items that, that we noticed. One is that it's what we call a scale out problem. So with, uh, with inference, you typically don't need to, uh, to perform inference on a giant data center, but rather you can do inference on one device or one server. And the, the, the more successful your product is, the more customers and requests you get, but then you can deploy, you can scale out the number of servers and just deploy the uh, service, the different requests in parallel. Now, another thing that is unique for inference is that we need to make sure that we can deploy them across the world because typically you want to perform inference close to where the requests are coming from and react very quickly. You, you typically have a latency bump. So we want to make sure that our inference form factor is low power and deployable in every data center in AWS. And we have tens, tens and tens of regions where we deploy inference. Training, on the other hand, is a different story. It's kind of an offline uh, workload where you train on a cluster of many machines, many servers. And in some, right. in some, in some form, the data center becomes the new computer for training, for training workloads. You train on tens of thousands of devices together. So that's what's called a scale-up workload where the, the, the cluster is very tightly connected with one another. And we we don't need to deploy close to a, a certain user because training runs for days and weeks and, and sometimes even months. So there is no no problem moving the uh, deploying in in uh, some remote data center and performing the training job there and then getting the results. There's uh, so that uh, that difference by the way scale up versus scale out also means that the amount of communication that we need to pack into the, these different form factors is different. So with Trainium, we need to have a lot of communication capability, very high bandwidth communication capabilities in order to interconnect these uh, chips and servers together. And with Inferentia, while we do need uh, some chip-to-chip connectivity, and that's, that's kind of interesting, we can discuss it uh, further, it doesn't need to be extremely high bandwidth. So we can kind of uh, create two form factors that are different for these the two workloads, but leverage the same underlying architecture. Okay, so question one is, are you able to explain to me what like form factor exactly means? And then the second, like the follow-on question from that is, when you talk about the Inferentia chip not needing the same kind of high bandwidth connectivity, I hypothesize that that allows you to ramp something else up. Correct. Yes, correct, correct. Uh, so let's talk about both. Uh, form factors are just packaging of the same underlying chip. So I'll actually have a board here. Maybe I can flash it. That's one of the boards that we, we kind of uh, oh, cool. based on these so, chips. 
So our YouTube, the like small percentage of super data science listeners who do it in the video format, you know, hold that up for a sec again. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, they get to they get to actually see like one of these chips up on screen. So uh, when you think about the form factor, you could take, for example, the same chip and put it on a different board with somewhat different characteristics, less input output uh, wires oh, and so on. Right. But it's the same same underlying chip. Uh, so these are different form factors. Right, right, right. So like on that, on the uh, board that you held up there, it looks like there might be like two chips on it. Correct. That's These are two chips. That's actually not the, the chip that we deploy right now. That's something that we, we work on internally. But uh, but yes, that's a form factor with two chips and a certain amount of I.O. Nice, nice, nice. So yeah, that's completely new information to me and like super cool because like I kind of like, yeah, I had no idea how to conceptualize this form factor thing. I've heard that before. But now it sounded like when I'm talking to you, it's like, yeah, there's so many questions that I've had for you today that I'm like, I would usually just kind of like let it like go. And I'm just like, okay, like weak compute versus strong compute. I kind of like at a high level know, know what it means, but it's awesome to have you actually break it down for us. And so, yeah, so this is a really cool thing too. So with these form factors, you have the same chip, but the way that you connect them to the surrounding board is different, uh, yes. which allows you to take advantage of different. So in the case of going back to the, the second question that I have for you and that you're just about to answer, but I'm not letting you, <laughs> is uh, with Trainium, you had, uh, you're, you're uh, specializing in having a high bandwidth uh, connectivity so that you can have a scale up workload uh, supporting lots, potentially tens of thousands of these Trainium chips working together to train a model over days, weeks, or maybe even months. Um, and then so with Inferentia, you can have the same chip but they're connected to the board in a different way, which allows for... Yeah, so the, with, with Inferentia, we we basically reduce the amount of I.O. or chip-to-chip or -chip connectivity, network connectivity that is not required for inference. And that allows us to do a couple of things. Uh, the first one is to, to reduce costs, and that's important in large-scale deployment. The other thing is to pack more of these compute servers in a single data center rack, and then we can have more compute density within the data center. And again, at the end of the day, it all comes into enabling our customers with best-in-class performance and, and price performance, basically the cost per inference that they can achieve. Cool. So yeah, so it lowers costs, which obviously, yeah, is super important to people, especially in that inference situation, because... You are going to, so uh, when you're training a model, you might say, okay, um, you know, we're going to need this many hundreds of processors running for a week in order to train our gigantic large language model. Um, but uh, so, so you're like, you're kind of like, well, that's a one-time cost and I'm willing to eat it and I'm willing to pay extra to have this uh, high bandwidth connectivity to have that training done in uh, one week instead of two. Yep. Um, but when you're doing inference, all of a sudden you're like, okay, this GPU is going to be running 24 seven all the time in order for our users to be able to make use of my LLM. And so then once you're in that situation, you're thinking about, okay, if this is running 24 seven, 365 days a year, uh, what can be done to lower costs without sacrificing performance? Exactly. But it's this inferential device that is going to run 24 seven, not the GPU. Oh man! Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a bad habit. We gotta get. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, the inferential device. Exactly. Nice. All right. So then, <laughs> well, so let me tie my flub and make it seem like I like. There's a reason why I did it on purpose. Uh, so I'm going to tie it into my next question. So uh, some people out there might have even framed the question that I just did and be thinking about GPUs in the cloud. Um, and so uh, why? Why was the development of these Trainium and, and Inferentia chips necessary? Like, what was there out there that your customers needed, that your users needed, that like the existing off-the-shelf GPUs that were designed initially for graphics processing weren't good enough for? And actually, I'm actually, as I asked the question, I'm starting to piece together that you've already kind of given us the answers, which is stuff like, <laughs> yes. like you already, you know, you talked about uh, using the systolic arrays to go from 50 to 99% efficiency. So obviously that's gonna relate to a cost saving. Uh, and then similarly, when people are using a training chip for training or an inferential chip for inference, for the reasons that you already went into, like high bandwidth connect connectivity or increased compute density respectively, 
these things are going to relate to lower costs for the customer. So did I just answer the whole question or did I leave anything for you? <laughs> exactly. Oh, most of it. But let me let me add just one uh, a little more. But yeah, it's uh, the the underlying reason is exactly what you said. We were trying to provide our customers with the best performance and best price performance, or so, so lower lowest cost tools. Um, and when we kind of looked at deep learning, we saw a workload that is exploding in popularity. So it was powering more and more applications. And as it was powering more applications, it was creating more compute demand. And as it was creating more compute demand, it created more uh, investment in terms of infrastructure and research, which improves the algorithm and then powers even more applications. And there's kind of a virtuous cycle here that kind of creates a lot of momentum momentum for AI. And I think we're seeing it in the last couple of years. So we, we realized that this is a workload that our customers care about a lot. And we, we had very good uh, offerings for our customers based on GPU for this workload. But we kind of stepped back and, and thought about the AWS scale, where we are servicing millions of customers, and whether we can use that scale in order to provide even more benefits, both in terms of performance and cost uh, for our customers. And that's when we, we realized that at this scale, it actually makes a lot of sense to get into a chip development project. It's not a, a, a small investment, but at our scale, it does make sense to make this investment in order to improve performance, cost efficiency, and energy efficiency even more for this workload, and then basically allow that uh, allow a, a, a more optimized infrastructure for our customer, offer more in, uh, optimized infrastructure to our customers, which in turn enables them to, to innovate even more. They can train larger models, they can train for lo- longer time and so on. And it kind of creates even more momentum to the cycle that I described before.